He dealt with fat phobia by developing an eating disorder and obsessive ex an obsession with exercise, which is a, unfortunately a very normal response um, to experiencing fat phobia day in and day out. Um, he went on to marry my grandmother, who was sort of the biggest girl in her family. And I remember with her, you know, she, I grew up learning, um, oh, like casual, casual disordered eating, casual, like, for example, she always said, first of all, she wore a girdle every day of her life. The minute she woke up, that was the first thing she would put on. Um, and the last thing she would take off at night. And I remember as a kid, she would tell me, you know, don't forget to buy clothes. It's a little bit too small so that, you know, it's a reminder that as you eat and your belly expands to stop eating. So, I mean, this is like a, dis this is a disordered eating method. Um, maybe you all have like experienced something like this, like the idea that you wear restrictive garments or you do certain behaviors to sort of create these rules around like how much you can eat and, and whatnot, right? So I'm being raised by two people who have, you know, a lot of fat phobia and disordered eating and body dysmorphia. My mother, um, is the person who kind of, you know, really, I mean, I think all of them were my champions, right? They always told me how great I was, how smart I was, how beautiful and special and all of these things that I was. So I didn't really learn to hate my body from them, but they all hated their body. So my mother, um, at the point where I'm, let's move forward in my story a little bit. I'm five years old. I'm introduced to fat phobia. I'm in like preschool, kindergarten, and there's a boy in my class named Joshua, and he's the first person who ever calls me fat. And I don't really know this word, but I know that from the way he's saying it that it's really bad. And Joshua is the kid who looks up all the girls' skirts. Um, and I sort of like, I remember thinking even then I felt like a connection. I was like, there's something about you know, he never looked up my skirt. He never wanted to look up my skirt. And there was like this distant understanding of like, there's some connection between the boy who's calling me fat and the fact that he's also the boy who's looking up all the girls' skirts. And I just even sense, I don't I didn't have the language. I wasn't a feminist yet, but I would go on in later life to understand, right? This was the beginnings of like, I was learning the connections between fat phobia and rape culture. Um, from that very like first moment, that so there was sexism, there was gender, there was like size, there were all kinds of things that are embedded in that moment with Joshua. Um, so I, from that day forward, I proceed to get really emotionally pummeled day in and day out for being a fat person. And if you grew up a fat kid, you probably know what I'm talking about. Like literally every single day. Um, like if a if if a day passed that someone wasn't verbally abusive to me, I would sit down. When I got home, I would run home, be so excited. I would write down everything I did, everything I wore, and try to emulate the next day every single thing with the hopes that I could control um, what was happening to me. So uh, you know, it, it progressed, right? It started from like this in deep sense of insecurity and sort of um, criticism of my of myself, and then it moved into very quickly restricting food. Um, because that was what I was told. I was told you're too big because you have the wrong relationship to food. So I internalize that, right? If you stop eating or you eat less or you eat the right amount, then people won't abuse you. That was how I understood it. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm willing to like basically eat nothing so that this abuse will stop. And yet, because like, again, going back to the genetics, um, you know, my body was always going to be this size, no matter how little I ate, no matter how many hours I exercised, it never quite was enough for my peers. So I'm now, let's call, let's sort of move forward in the story, maybe like 10 years old, and I've already experienced starvation for the first time. I've already undergone starvation in between fourth and rather fifth and sixth grades. The summer in between, I wanted to transform. Um, and so I started to eat basically like only lettuce and I would like dip it in a sauce, like a ketchup or whatever, which sounds, you know, quite terrible. But like at the time was like, oh, it's kind of like zhuzhing up the lettuce a little bit. So I was literally living off of lettuce and uh, exercising two hours, sometimes three hours a day um, over you know, a three month period. Um, and, uh, and I'm really thinking this time I got it. I'm like, there's, I can't eat pretty much any less. I can't exercise really any more than this as like a 10 year old or whatever. Um, and I go back in to see my doctor, uh, my family doctor before I go start sixth grade. And he's like, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. You look great. 
Um, I mean, if you keep going, you might be able to date one of my sons. And, and again, kind of there's like that, that kind of reminder, this is about gender, this is about desire, and it's about male desire and this kind of idea that like, my, that, you know, that abuse is, that, that, that somehow like if I become thin, then males will desire me and I will, they will not abuse me. Um, and that was kind of like, again, I'm not really articulating this, but it's like, it's in my subconscious. Uh, so at this point, I'm like, I can't go any, like how much less can I eat? How many more hours can I exercise? Um, and I started to get really desperate. And I remember at that point I was really, there was a day where I was crying um, in the car with my mother. And I was like, you just don't understand. She was like, you're beautiful, you're great. Like, you know, you're, once this is over, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna have everything you want. You're gonna find love. So she, she was such a like, she was such a, a source of inspiration. But I was like, you don't get it. My life right now is trash. Like I need this to stop. And I remember there was like a turn in that moment. And that was like the day that I kind of realized Again, don't really have the language for it. That's the day I learned that my mom also had an eating disorder, that she had bulimia. Um, so she, we were sitting in the car, she kind of drove me to the grocery store, and she said, the key to becoming thin is learning to hate the food that you love. So you make a list, and you start with number one, your favorite thing, and you eat it until you're sick, and you'll never want it again. And then you move on to number two. And, you know, I mean, anybody who, like, grew up with disordered eating or has had an eating, like, that's just, I mean, it just gives me chills just thinking about this is the advice that my mother, who in, desper in her desperation to get me out of the suffering, is extending a hand into teaching me what she had to do. Because she went through what I did, and my grandparents went through what I did. So, um, right, and, like, and, and the thing that's really nuts is, like, I, okay, so I'm aging, I'm aging, right? Um, I, I don't end up developing bulimia. I've got this like horrible fear of barfing. <laughs> so uh, thankfully, like that didn't that didn't stick. But I was still very anorexic and, and orthorexic. So really, really like thinking food that had calories and it was contaminated. Um, wanting to exercise all of the time, feeling like I can't eat. I wasn't purging, but I would eat and then I would exercise obsessively. Um, so that was my life for like 20 years. Um, and then I kind of go to college. It's a little bit different. It's not like day in, day out, people abusing me to my face. Um, it's, it starts to look like, you know, who wants to be your friend who doesn't? Who wants to date you who doesn't? Your thin friends are having this experience and I'm having this different experience in college. Um, and so by total happenstance in my mid twenties, this is now after college, I'm like 24, 25. I end up meeting um, a fat positive partner um, it's kind of this totally wild thing. I had a, like a radio show for a little while and he, this person sent me an email and he was like, you seem really cool. Can we chat or something? I've listened to your show and you seem smart and I'd like to talk to you. And then it, 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 this turns into like a six year relationship. Um, and, and really like, you know, it, it was incredible because he was the first person I'd ever dated who um, really said to me, no one gets to tell you what your body looks like. No man, no woman, no one, right? Like nobody you're dating, nobody else gets to tell you what your body looks like. Um, it's yours. And it was just like, I mean, this had never occurred to me <laughs> at 24, 25 years old. Um, and he really helped, uh, like not only, right, I think that until, until I met him, I really thought no one will ever, ever fully love me. I will have to trick them. I will have to be very smart, very funny, very talented, know a lot of cultural references. Um, I have to be the most sexually talented. And then I will trick someone into loving me. They will never love me for my body. They will love me in spite of it. And he really showed me that, that, that I didn't have to settle for that. Um, which was really life altering. He also coincidentally, this like an angelic human being, I don't even know. Um, he also helped me work through a lot of my disordered eating. Like he would sit with me in the kitchen while we'd prepare food and he would hold my hand while he was like, okay, we're gonna have pasta, right? And to someone who's like really deep in disordered eating and disordered thinking about food, pasta is like saying like, we're gonna throw a baby in here, it's gonna be alive. Um, and so it's like, it's terrifying. Um, and so I'm like, okay, pasta, uh, panic attack, right? 
So he's like, it's okay, pasta's not bad. We can just put it in the little pot. It's great. And then he's like, oh, I had an idea. What if we put cheese in there? I'm like, and cheese is like even worse. Like just like, 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 like let's just like kill a village full of people for no reason. And it's like, I'm, you know, again, like in this deep disorder thinking, and I'm just like, cheese, I'm like freaking out. Um, and he's like, it's okay. You know, we're going to do this. We're going to put it in the pot. It's going to be great, right? So we have like this mac and cheese moment. It's just like etched in my memory is like this time when you know my partner who and I think really like he really taught me that if your partner isn't your community then they're not should like they shouldn't be your boo um if they're not here to like help you and gas you and like help you heal in ways that are I mean obviously not like trying to save you or anything like that but like trying to support you can give you those like um those same pep talks those same things that your friends would give you then you probably shouldn't be dating them. And it was just like, he really leveled me up in a lot of really incredible ways through his, like, the way that he thought. And I remember at that, so progressing when I'm now almost 30 years old, I'm still diet. I still have like these residual, like something's wrong with me. I should probably be on a diet all the time. I probably need something, but I'm going to die, all this stuff, right? Like I believed everything that I had been taught about being fat. Um, and then I end up in grad school and I start being really interested in studying how weight discrimination impacts gender. Um, and uh, so, so that's a whole nother story. But through that, I end up discovering fat activism, which is like this group of incredible human beings at that time in the Bay Area, though fat activism is all over the world. Um, and I, for the first time in my life, was in a community of people. Like, oh, uh, the, the story goes like this. Like, somebody was like, have you heard of this conference? It's a fat conference. It's like in two weeks, you should probably go because you're doing research related to that. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go. Um, so I sign up to go to the conference. I get there. I take, like, the commuter train, the bus, or, like, 14 transfers. Finally, at the hotel where the conference is, and I'm, like, walking through the breezeway of the conference center and I'm just hearing laughter and splashing and then I like walk out and there's just like this incredible scene of like fat people everywhere at a swimming pool wearing amazing bathing suits like um really incredible and they're just laughing and they're having fun and they're like wearing cute sunglasses and they're floating on stuff and they're just like they're just like living and I'd never seen anything like this before and then um there's a there one person comes out from this side of the the sort of tableau and she's wearing this like red white polka dot vintage style bikini with cat eye sunglasses and she has this big belly right and like big arms and big thighs and she's just sauntering out and there's like this boy following her with a parasol <laughs> over her head and I was like oh oh like I was like oh my god this is possible I like I didn't know that I think I didn't quite know that that was what I wanted and I don't think I, I definitely didn't know that I could have it at, as a fat person um, and it was like that moment where it was like, she was kind of like my saint. Like if people talk about religious experiences, they fall to their knees, like whatever, I give my life over to this. Um, she was a little bit like, uh, she was like my religious ecstatic saint person for me. Um, and, uh, and you know, basically from there, from then on, I just dedicated my life to doing this work, to trying to end weight discrimination, to helping people understand not only the data that the basically right that our culture is not only wrong morally for how it thinks about fat people but it's just wrong <laughs> literally also um it was really powerful because when i first started i was like i don't care about the health argument i do not care i care about human beings i know what i went through i know i've met like 50 100 fat people they've all gone through the same thing so this is clearly a human rights problem and i didn't i wasn't even interested in the research i was like i don't care what the research says we've got a human rights argument right here people shouldn't be treated like that period um and and but then right as the longer i started I, this i've been in this career the more i was like i gotta look at the research we'll see what let's see what it says and i was like what not only is this thing horrible and just not only is fat phobia like horrible and disgusting and anti-humanitarian and terrible and we should all be ashamed of like the fact that it's just running rampant through the streets but it doesn't even have a basis in research like there's not even any research that shows that this works that weight like not only does weight loss not work but it actually makes people like it moves people's set point which we'll talk about in a second 
higher over time that it actually in fact makes people bigger, which I'm like, I'm here for people being bigger, um, but that's allegedly not the point of this. So it was really shocking to understand that I was like, wow, so if that phobia isn't just like hot flaming trash, like on a cultural, like kind of just human level, but it's like not even supported by research. And it was just like one of those moments where you're like, what are we doing here, you know? Um, so that kind of, that's a long story. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, <laughs> like slide three, um, minute 45. Uh, okay, so does it, are you seeing the slide that says critically examine the health? Okay, great. <laughs> so that's what we're heading into right now. Let's just move on ahead. Um, so, uh, right, kind of, I just want to jump right into it, right? The current prevailing question but isn't being fat just unhealthy, right? This is kind of like, this is the question I always get. This is the question I always have to address, right? When I'm talking about this uh, conversation. Um, and, and the problem with the question is that the onus of the question, the onus really of like, you know, this overall like, yeah, this question falls on the oppressed group to change in order to accommodate bias. So it's the same, I mean, if you can kind of, if you think more broadly about oppression, um, asking this question is like saying, well, in general, and this, this is an actual fact, black Americans live shorter lives than white Americans. So shouldn't black Americans just try to be white people? Wouldn't that just solve this? Um, I think it's just a gross misunderstanding of how oppression works. Um, and it ends up becoming a method of victim blaming. Um, so. The outcomes of this, I just said, victim blaming, stress on the oppressed group, bypassing of consent, right? I think right now there's this idea that what, like, there's something wrong with me and no matter what, whether I like my body or not, whether I'm fine or not, whether I'm like whatever the doctor's idea of healthy is or not, I should still want to be a thin person and that thin people get to bypass my consent because they are just somehow more knowledgeable than me. Um, be, just, just by virtue of being thin. Um, this is what I mean by bypassing of consent. Um, it leads to medical bias, which we'll talk more about in a second. Less preventive care for higher weight people, which I, there's research on this, we'll go into that. A wage gap between higher weight people and straight size people. Um, in general, I know the research for plus size women. Now, mind you, 70% of people in the US are plus size. So this is unlike other forms of oppression where they're actually usually numeric minorities we're talking about. We're talking about a numeric majority that is being oppressed in line with numeric minorities, which is interesting, kind of paradoxical. Um, for plus size women, the wage gap between you know, us and straight size women is anywhere between $9,000 and $19,000 a year. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the invisibilization of discrimination, when, you, when there's victim blaming, that means that it makes it harder to see the discrimination is happening. Um, doctors prescribing food restriction, aka dieting, which is correlated with eating disorders. One in four people who are regular dieters will go on to have an eating disorder, which is one of the deadliest mental illnesses that we have, that, that, that like on record. Um, and so anyway, doctors prescribing food restriction uh, to higher weight patients pretty much consistently. Um, I would argue the better question, the more humanitarian question, the question that I think is more substantiated by research and that is just better for humans is what's the right thing to do if we accepted that weight bias harms people, that it shortens life expectancy, which I will get into in a second, and is therefore a pressing human rights issue. So what's the moral imperative if we look at the research, if we look at what weight stigma does, what is the moral imperative here? Not, is this person healthy or not, but knowing that stigma harms and kills people and shortens their life expectancy, what is the right thing to do? Um, in this situation, I would say it's, it's superior in that the onus falls on society, on all of us, not the individual experiencing the oppression. It falls on medicine, to come correct, um, and people who want to oppress fat people. And I wanna say here, I'm calling out medicine, and I mentioned that there was a training earlier, and I really, I don't think I have a slide that says this in this, in this deck, but it's important to understand fat discrimination, right? Like, so, so let me back up and say, right now in New York City, there's a bill that's up for vote that would, uh, that would add weight to as a protected category, um, at, such as you know, added to like race, gender, disability, et cetera. So it's important to understand that, right, like this is, um, 
this work is part of a trajectory of like trying to end groups being discriminated against. And with that in mind, it's important to understand that just like weight discrimination, there was a time when racism was justified through the language of science. There was a time when sexism was justified through the language of science. There was a time when, right, like racist science said that the human skull could be measured and that criminality could be determined by that measurement. These were not cuckoo, weirdo, right, people. They weren't like, right, these were like, the, these were medical doctors. <laughs> Um, and so it's important to understand that it's not like weight discrimination um, is sort of medically substantiated or validated by medicine. And we've never seen this show before. It's that this is very much in line <laughs> with, um, with the ways in which oppressed groups have been oppressed, right? Society isn't just like the president and people on top. Society is made up of academia, the church, the medical field, right? Like the, the, there are sort of pillars of society when we're talking about society, okay? Um, so the outcomes of this, I would argue, are individuals and entities who practice discrimination will be asked to stop. Health outcomes always improve when individuals experience less stigma in addition to that. So let's move on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I kind of also, this is another side by side. So the current health focused approach um, so, you know, basically teaches us that to be suspicious of embodied feelings and we're encouraged to adopt an intellectual, AKA enlightened anti-human relationship to food and body. So the current health approach really does promote a very um, intellectual relationship to how you eat and what your body looks like and what your body feels like, even potentially. Um, we are, this, this system is characterized by binaries, so good versus junk food, wrong versus right bodies, good versus bad bodies, learners versus knowers. Um, I was just doing a lecture yesterday with Food Core um, and basically talking about um, how in our culture we learn, uh, you know, basically there's two, two types of people, the people who know how to eat correctly and the people who don't. And often people who are in the don't are people who are in marginalized bodies and people who do know are the correct eaters or whatever. They're often in like more privileged bodies. Um, the system is characterized by restriction and control, assimilation. So um, food becomes a way of becoming a good citizen, a moral citizen. Utility, food is primarily seen as something that should promote health. Food is seen as fuel for a machine, the body. Fear. Um, that the wrong relationship to food and body could lead to disease and death. So right now, you know, if you look over here on the left hand of the slide, this is the paradigm that we're living in. It's extremely anxiety inducing. Um, it leads to body dysmorphia, it leads to disordered eating, it leads to all kinds of like fractured relationships to the self, to intuition and to food. Um, we can, in my mind, right, we can create both in microcosms and also just in larger, in larger environments. We can live in a culture that affirms a pro-human relationship to food and body rooted in instinct. Hunger is one of those things. Uh, hunger is part of instinct. Intuition, pleasure, connection, care, cultural affirmation, play, fun, comfort, and self-trust. And I kind of want to say like, you know, and, and what's interesting is that the stuff on the right hand side, which might sound a little bit woo or whatever, um, is also substantiated by data to have better long-term health outcomes. Um, a great example is this research that came out, this is actually from the 70s, but they discovered that when people enjoy food, they absorb more nutrition from the food. So pleasure has an impact on actual nutrient absorption. So these things aren't just like concepts that, are, that seem nice, they have empirical bases and like actually help promoting um, outcomes. So let's move on. So as a culture, we've been taught to see our bodies and food through a carceral, colonial, and neoliberal lens. And we're gonna like break that down. So carceral, you've probably heard, I feel like there's a lot of attention on carcerality right now. The belief that our bodies are dangerous and always on the verge of rebellion. Um, rebellion equals fatness. And it justifies the need to punish, ostracize, and dehumanize people with unlawful bodies. So carcerality is basically a referencing to prison, the prison industrial complex. And um, what's interesting, right, is like, you know, I think 
amazing prison abolitionists argue that when you look at the culture, like, you know, <laughs> a friend of mine is a poet and he says, if there's a prison in your city, then your city is a prison. Um, and he t basically, right, the ways in which society has to be shaped and our psychology has to be shaped in order to accept carcerality at the level that we have it in the United States. So carcerality shows up in diet culture and how we treat our bodies and food. Um, colonialism, right, the body becomes the savage or the racialized other that must be tamed, disciplined, and governed by the more quote-unquote civilized, coded as white mind. And finally, neoliberal. So neoliberal is a, is a term, an economics term that uh, references um, the way in which American capitalism works, right, just like pick yourself up by the bootstraps. If you want something bad enough, you can have it. If you work hard enough, and if you didn't, if you didn't get it, it's because you didn't work hard enough. Um, the individual is, re is responsible for controlling their body as private property in order to prevent social punishment, including medical neglect and medical pathology. So we're going to keep going. A lot of words. Thank you for hanging out with me. Um, let's move into defining and examining fat phobia and anti-fatness. Here we go. Um, what, what is fat phobia? What is anti-fatness? It is a socially acceptable form of bigotry against higher weight people justified through the language of health and morality. Um, and I really want to underscore the word bigotry. This is another thing that happens when the conversation gets completely focused on health. Again, it invisibilizes the discrimination is occurring. It creates a reality in which someone can discriminate against a person and believe that they are acting morally. Um, through the lens of health, right? So it invisibilizes the act of discrimination to the person who is doing it and to the culture at large and the person who is also experiencing it. Um, common fat phobic tropes and beliefs, fat people don't care about our health. Um, I was literally, I had, a, I had an interview with NPR a, a few days ago and, um, and the person, it was the show here and now, and the host was like, well, and we're talking about the New York City law, and she was like, well, isn't there a reason why, for example, like a, a, an employer wouldn't want a fat person to sit at the desk at the gym? And I was like, well, I mean, no, uh, I don't think so. Um, and she was like, well, but I mean, but like, how would that person know how to operate like exercise machinery? And I'm like, do, I'm like, do you think that thin people are just born with it? I'm like, do you think every thin person just knows how to, and we just, none of us. I was, it was kind of, I was, it was really, it was one of those moments where you're like, I'm so grateful that like you don't even know how insulting because I'm like it's so useful to me to understand the depths of the bigotry where it's just like completely illogical um and I'm like it's it's not like thin people like are handed like you know more software like a pamphlet and they all know how to do use exercise equipment and we don't um it's like in fact I don't know if this is if this has ever occurred to you host of here and now but is it possible that like as a fat person I am expected to know more about diets and food restriction and calories and exercise equipment than someone who isn't experiencing what I'm experiencing. And I think it, it kind of, it, it's fa it, what's fascinating about it and the, the bigotry is how real it is and yet how invisible it is to people who don't experience it. Um, I mean, and I have to share this. I shared this this morning. So if you were here, sorry for the repeat, but I remember a moment having a conversation with a good friend who's a thin person, just, who was a eating disorder survivor, um, anorexia, like, you know, former anorexic. And, and, um, and she's always been kind of in a, in a small body. And she said, Virgie, when thin people, people have always been thin, they look at fat people and they think, what would I have to do in my imagination to be that size? They don't think this person is working their butt off to try and like meet some standard that they're never going to be able to meet statistically. Um, they're thinking that, oh, you must never leave the house. You must never go for a walk. You must eat five times what I eat. You must do 18 times more of this and 18 times less of this because in order for me to be your size that's what I would have to do right that's kind of the the and this is and it was like one of those aha moments right because I'm living right I just told you my whole story I was living with anorexia for 20 years and no one noticed um and I'm you know I'm like grilling rack every second of every day is dedicated to becoming a thin person which i'm being told is possible 
Um, and so this is like inconceivable. I'm like, what? They don't know that I'm like out here hating myself, like working out every day, eating lettuce for three months. How can they not know? How can they not notice? Right. And, and so I think this is, again, one of those things where if you're living in a marginalized body, whether it's a racialized body or a disabled body or like whatever, right, that like the people who aren't living that experience have no idea how hard you're working. They just think like they're out here like killing it and like you're just sucking. And I'm like, no, I'm out here working six times as hard as you and not getting a third of where you're getting, just not even trying. Or maybe you are trying. But like, I mean, I think I learned this in college, right, with, with class privilege where it's like, if you sort of um, start out in a place of privilege, you can be working really hard. That doesn't mean that you're not, it doesn't mean you're not working hard if you have accomplishments, but, uh, but someone who doesn't have that privilege can be working three times, four times, five times as hard and won't even get halfway to where you are. And so I think it's important to understand in the, in the conversation about body size that, um, in fact, a lot of higher weight people have either historically or currently working extremely hard to try and meet this, the thin standard that our culture puts forward and are dedicating their lives to it and aren't getting the results that they're supposed to get. And they're blaming themselves. I'm going to show you the research of, of why they shouldn't blame themselves because the research is pretty clear. Um, another trope is that people can't have a restrictive eating disorder like anorexia. Um, fat people can't handle, can handle more pain and suffering. Um, so this leads to things like, I think this is very subconscious, but this leads to things like doctors not prescribing as much pain medication, do doctors not prescribing care when fat patients come in and have a symptom. Um, fat people's desire and autonomy doesn't matter, including forcing advice and weight loss onto fat people. Fat people don't know or understand how to be healthy, otherwise they would be thin people. And finally, thin people's beliefs about us matter more than what we think, want, or need. Um, so again, this is where you see the clear, I mean, for me, it's like the discrimination component is very clear because the first class citizen in our culture is supposed to be thin people, and the second class citizen is supposed to be higher weight people. And this kind of shows up in like very, in, in I think, subconscious attitudes. So let's keep going. Um, okay. So here are some more examples of fat phobic attitudes or beliefs. Some of them are a little bit more subtle, so I wanted to really delineate them. Higher weight people can become thin people. This belief that any person of any size can, if they want badly enough, to not only become thin, but to stay thin their entire lives. There's also a belief, I think, that higher weight people somehow are ill. And so if we get past a certain point or we lose a certain amount of weight, then we will have shed the illness or something, which is, I mean, that whole framework is, is not correct um, and also very bigoted. That higher weight people are sick or have an emotional eating problem. Um, that higher weight people are struggling with their weight. Again, all, all higher weight people are struggling with their weight. All higher, higher weight people want to be thin people. Um, all higher weight people are always less healthy than thin people. Um, are, are fat people are less disciplined than thin people, need to be on a diet, can't possibly have anorexia or bulimia, I already talked about that, are less capable or desirable as a colleague or a candidate or a partner, will die young because of their weight. Um, mind you, I, I would just want to say, you know, we're going to talk about BMI in a second, but technically speaking, people in the overweight category live the longest of anyone, just putting that out there. Um, should that, that fat people should accept the prevailing public health approach to weight, that fat people should uncritically obey the medical field's advice despite its history of harming people in larger bodies. So let's continue. Um, I want to get into some of like the, the, the impact, the live reality. So I talked a little bit, I alluded to this in my own story, but in the United States, um, most children have already begun to internalize fat phobia by the age of five. Researchers go in and they ask groups of five-year-olds if they would rather lose an arm or be fat or lose a parent or be fat, and they always choose losing an arm or losing a parent. Um, I already mentioned this figure. 9,000 is, is sort of the bottom rate for, or the bottom estimate of the range of how much income fat women lose per year um, in, in, sort of in, in sort of in comparison to their straight size colleagues. And when the research, when the researchers got in and were like, what is this about? They found that in general, um, 
that plus size people, plus size women in particular in this case, were often uh, opting into or were getting pushed into more care oriented, non client facing, lower paying jobs. So often more physically oriented jobs that are lower paying and that thin, uh, thin or straight sized people were more likely to end up in client facing positions that are more sedentary desk work that is higher paid. Um, so that's kind of one of the biggest uh, theories as to what this disparity is. And I mentioned this already, 68% is the percentage of U.S. women, though across the board, people of all genders in general, it's about 70% of U.S. Uh, of people in the U.S. are a size 14 or above or are plus size in a larger body. Let's keep going. Oh, these are a lot of words. Again, thank you so much for for hanging out with me and looking at all these words. Um, so we're gonna get into kind of, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the data because I think it's really, really powerful. Um, I'm gonna read this to you. This is from a 2020 paper. Um, health policies routinely emphasize weight loss as a target for health promotion. These policies rest upon the assumptions one, that higher body weight equals poorer health. Two, that long-term weight loss is widely achievable. And three, that weight loss results in consistent improvements in physical health. Our review of the literature suggests that these three assumptions are not supported empirically. So um, what does that mean? That's a lot of big words. Um, what it means is that we have these kind of three very, very important presumptions that go into how we think of health and how we measure health. And all three of them aren't supported by the data. So the first one, that higher weight people are always less healthy, not true. I'm gonna, there's, a, there's a data point in here that I'm going to talk about in there in a second. That long-term weight loss is widely achievable, also not true. Um, and that weight loss results in consistent improvements in physical health, also not true. Um, so these are major presumptions in the health discussion and, the art and sort of like the cultural zeitgeist the moment we're in right now. Uh, okay, so food restriction. So I mean, what's interesting, right? Let me go back really quickly. No, I don't. I don't know how to click back. Um, uh, it, what's important to understand is that there are sort of like, let's call it three things that really, um, you know, basically create larger bodies. The first, the most, the most, the biggest one is genetics. Um, genetics is the biggest indicator of generally what size you're going to be and what weight range you're going to kind of be at. Um, again, this is like, I mean, no, no, I was going to put an asterisk on it, but that's going to get too confusing. So we'll start there. So genetics is a big one. The other big one is dieting. Um, that changes and, and makes people tends to like move your uh, set point, which we'll talk about in a second, higher and higher over time, the longer that you do it. And the third is stuff we can't understand or explain. So those are the three things that kind of create larger bodies. Um, so I think it's, it's important to understand that, um, Right, like, uh, you know, I, I think that might be surprising to hear, right? Um, so, yeah, so food restriction, aka dieting, is not correlated with long-term weight loss, but it is correlated with um, an increased likelihood of an eating disorder. Like I said, one in four people who diet go on to have eating disorders, um, depression, anxiety, binging, uh, disconnection from hunger cues, worse long-term decision making. Um, delaying of important life moments and kind of the ongoing dehumanizing and stressful experience of hunger. Um, so again, food restriction is correlated with all of this. It's not correlated with better long-term health outcomes. Again, longitudinally speaking, it's not correlated with people becoming thin people. It's not correlated with better mental health. It's correlated with these things. That's what the research says. So uh, let's keep going. Um, uh, so this is about kind of preventive care. So higher BMI was associated with less frequent receipt of preventive services among middle-aged white women, elderly white women, and men. There's a lot of these data points. This is just from one very specific paper, but across the board, in general, higher weight people receive less preventive care. What does that mean, right? Like it means a few things. First of all, that higher weight people are perhaps opting out of potentially discriminatory medical experiences. And it also means that um, you know, medical providers are refusing to give the preventive care. And this means that when, when medical providers are seeing their fat patients over time with less medical care, with less preventive care, potentially opting out of medical care because of discrimination, they're now seeing this fat patient in more acute states of distress and more acute states of illness, which re 
enforces the discrimination and the bigoted ideas that the whole thing started with. So it ends up kind of becoming this really vicious cycle. And we see this with other discriminated groups as well, like people of color, queer people, trans people also. Um, let's keep going. Uh, this is the this is an image of Rebecca Hiles, who at the time of this interview in 2018, she was 28 years old, but she began to have um, really acute coughing fits to the point that she couldn't really breathe and went to the doctor on several occasions and was told, you're just fat, you just need to lose weight, um, and these will go away. It turns out that she had uh, cancer. Um, and so this 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 um, case is being, I think it's still being adjudicated. She went in and decided to sue her doctors based on neglect. Um, and, and I mean, right, like this is one of those outcomes which uh, happens, right, when sort of discrimination disallows doctors from taking higher weight patients seriously. And again, when I talk to people in larger bodies about their experience with medical care, in general, the story is, I come in for anything, a cough, an ear infection, my knee hurts, I have like something weird is happening, I'm having coughing fits. The, the recommendation is always just lose weight. Um, there's no serious treatment of the issue, typically. So let's keep going. Um, higher BMI was associated, oh, I already did this one, sorry about that. Uh, it's, I need to, Okay, wait, sorry, I can't see. Is this, does this slide say weight discrimination was associated? Okay, actually, I'm sorry, I can see it. You're right, you're pointing to me, thank you. Um, weight discrimination was associated with an increase in mortality risk of nearly 60% in participants. This increased risk was not accounted for by common physical and psychological risk factors. In addition to its association with poor health outcomes, weight discrimination may shorten life expectancy. Um, so this is a really important, uh, again, when we're talking about kind of the health argument and the human rights argument, one of the things that r rarely gets brought up in the conversation about health and weight is the ways in which stigma impacts health. And again, there's a, there's a body of research called minority stress theory that really talks about how if you're in a marginalized group, it creates outcomes like having a shortened life. Um, like having cardiovascular issues, having high blood pressure, having issues with major organs. These things are all connected to stress, whether you're a person of color or you're experiencing weight stigma or you're a queer person, right? Um, Stress-related impact on the body is never considered when we're talking about the issue of weight. Um, let's keep going. So I want to meet. I want you to, uh, to introduce you to Adolf Quetelet, uh, who invented the BMI. Um, has anyone heard of Adolf Quetelet before? Yeah, there's been a lot of articles about ye olde Adolf lately. Um, so he was a Belgian mathematician who invented the BMI in the 1830s, um, using only white men, specifically like uh, soldiers. Um, and the BMI is still used as the ultimate measure of health in the United States. It's important to, to take a second to talk about Adolf because um, I think a few things, right? So what Adolf did was he brought in all these soldiers um, and he weighed all of them and he averaged their weights and it created a bell curve. So then what Adolf did was, is, is he took the median, sort of like the center point of the bell curve and said, this is the ideal man from which all other men deviate, right? There's, again, there's nothing in the data that indicate that that median, the median is just the median. It has nothing to do with superiority or inferiority, whether that person's ideal or not ideal. But he, um, he sort of projected that, his own opinion onto the data. Um, and his work, it's important to know, ended up becoming um, some of the undergirding of eugenics. Um, so I think right, like when we think about the BMI and the history of the BMI, which emerged at the height of colonialism, not an accident, I would say. Um, so right, like you know, some people argue just because a tool has a problematic history doesn't mean we should throw out the tool, which I would generally agree with. Uh, I think what's complicated about the BMI, though, is right um, to this day, the BMI determines things like whether or not you will get life insurance whether or not you will get health insurance and how much it costs. Um, it determines things like, you know, uh, like I think about the BMI being taken for me in high school. It determines where I rank in like kind of the, in my PE class, which is then sent on to this like national fitness standard test, right? Um, so I mean, and also BMI determines, like in, when we're looking at populations, BMI determines who's getting public health intervention and who's not. 
So if you're in a zip code that has higher BMIs, you're more likely to be targeted for all kinds of public health interventions. Um, so, uh, you know, arguably, even though this tool was designed for a very different purpose, it is still basically separating the ideal from the non-ideal, who will be intervened upon and who will not, um, who is seen as a learner, who is seen as a knower. Okay, continuing on. Um, I want to talk about healthism. It's a very, I think it's really important. I already used the, I already talked about neoliberalism, which is the idea of like, everybody just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, that economic uh, principle is applied to health in our, in our culture. So healthism is the belief system that sees health as the property and responsibility of the individual and ranks the personal pursuit of health above anything else. And there's a little paragraph at the bottom, right? Essentially, right, this belief is not based in data. I'm about to show you this as well. So, right, like, again, when we're talking about weight, we're talking about health, there is this, like, belief that the individual has 100% control over how long and how long their life is and the quality of their life. That's the belief in the United States. And what I'm about to show you is like, that's not actually what research says like at all, um, but it's, it's a very strong belief because, right, why? Because essentially if we, if we are all individually responsible for how well we live or how long we live, then the culture doesn't have to do anything, <laughs> right? Like you don't need universal health care, like anything that any other democratic socialist country slash not even some uh, many countries that aren't even democratic socialist countries, like you don't need that. You just need to work really hard and cleanse and you need to, you know, you need to like drink juice and you need to like do that. You don't need, you don't need health care that's affordable. You need to cleanse, right? Um, and so like, I think the whole, right, and so it really, it really goes back to that kind of individual, like who bears the responsibility? Does the individual bear responsibility for everything they experience? Or is the culture that's like, right, benefiting from the citizens, um, are they responsible for something and how much? So let's get into the research on kind of like how, why this is, why this is substantiated by data. So, um, this is, a, this is kind of a question, but I, the answer is already circled. How much do individual determinants of health impact our overall health as compared to, ooh, I jumped the gun. Hold on, y'all. I need to back up and say something. I'm going to back up for real. This I did it. <laughs> um, so uh, our health is actually, you know, every person in here, um, your health is made up of a combination of social determinants and individual determinants. So, so, so that's like, you know, you, uh, everyone in here's overall health in the, in the pie chart of your health, there's a combination of social determinants and individual determinants. So social determinants are things over which you have no control, whether or not you experience oppression, um, whether or not you grew up having access to clean water, public transportation, uh, you know, basically, if, did you live in an area that had a lot of resources? Did you grow up in a home with um, a parent who was emotionally regulated or dysregulated, right? Did you, like these kinds of privileges, right? Did you grow up with that or did you not? These are things that people can't control. You cannot control what what home you grew up in, what neighborhood you grew up in. These things are very, very important in social determinants of health. And then there's the individual determinants of health, which are the stuff we're talking about, food, exercise, um, meditation, a huge other part of individual determinants is genetics. So within the overall pie chart, again, we're talking about social, individual. Um, the question that I'm posing for you is what percentage in the pie, I've already, you already saw the answer, but um, what percentage in the pie is social determinants versus individual determinants? And we come to learn that um, the answer is uh, 30 to 40 percent of your overall health is something you can individually determine. And that 30% figure is the CDC and 40% is Kaiser. Um, so, I mean, I'm more inclined to the CDC, but I thought I'd put the Kaiser number out there since it's a bit more uh, conservative. Um, so anyway, I, I, I'm inclined to, to sort of believe the CDC. I'm gonna favor that one in this conversation moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, so just to kind of really, really like get it in there, right? So our overall health in the pie chart, 30%, of uh, our overall health is individual determinants. And within that 30% is genetics, which is probably, I don't have the numbers on this one, but I, we could probably guess it's probably at least 
five percent, if not if not fifteen percent, if not a lot more, right? We don't. I don't know, but uh, let's just call it let's call it five percent. Be really conservative. So twenty five percent of the pie is what's left of what you what you, how you eat, whether you meditate, whether or not you get enough sleep, all that stuff, right? Is left in that twenty five percent. So, uh, and again, this is sort of, I mean, if you can go into the CDC website, look all this, look all of this stuff up. Um, so, I mean, the question for me, the philosophical question becomes, how are we so obsessed with that 25, 30%? And, and why aren't we at least twice as obsessed with that 70% figure? Because isn't that where we should be moving the needle? Um, so, I mean, right, like, I mean, I just kind of, I think, again, like when we're talking about this conversation, I always learn that people really, really have this belief that their individual behaviors are what is determining their health. It is terrifying, in fact, to accept that how long you live and the quality of your life is largely out of your hands. It's really scary. <laughs> and that's where diet culture comes from. The, the dealing with the terror of that, dealing with the terror of the fact that like we kind of get the hand that we're dealt. Um, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that those individual determined, that 25% doesn't matter, but it, it really contextualizes kind of like what all of this conversation is really about. We're really pushing for something that is largely out of people's control. Um, okay, moving on. So I want to kind of explore the frameworks of fat positivity and food positivity. We've got a little bit, I know we have to leave it six, are we leaving at six or am I, are we about, am I supposed to end this? What? 540? Four zero. Okay, great. Okay, got to move it along. Um, I don't think we will have time for Q&A, unfortunately. But, uh, okay, but feel free to come talk to me afterwards if you, if you want. So we're going to explore these frameworks. I think they're really powerful. Um, let's, I'm going to skip ahead. Oops, this one is formatted very poorly. Oh no, it looks great on the screen. Okay, so how do we shift the focus away from food, um, away from like the fear of disease and death and towards joy, positivity, and aliveness? And I think for me, certainly as a person in a larger body, though, I think everybody of all sizes can adopt um, something called fat positivity. So fat positivity is um, this set of principles, right? Seeing fat bodies as a natural, beautiful part of body diversity. Um, understanding that weight gain or weight restoration can be a very positive and important part of healing for people of all sizes. And I think really it's important to understand, um, I, I'll get back to the, the, the third thing on the slide in a second. It's important to understand that um, Fat phobia manifests in multiple dimensions. It manifests intrapersonally, how you see yourself, interpersonally, how other people treat you based on your body, and institutionally, how easily you can navigate society based on your body size. So really, right, like we can be impacted on all three levels potentially, but like even a person in a smaller body can still have very high internalized fat phobia, very high internalized, like very high body dysmorphia rate, right? So uh, moving on, not seeing fat people as failed thin people. There is not a thin person inside of me, um, you know, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not like, it's not like I, it's not like I sort of just have the wrong body. Um, this is the exact body that I'm supposed to have. This is the exact body that's right for me. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, that was like a very important realization for me. Um, seeing fat phobia as the problem that needs to be fixed, not fat bodies. Not asking or pondering invasive questions like, how did you get this way? Or, you know, do you have, an, do you have like a, some kind of, a lot of, I mean, I think I've had people presume that when I say I've had, a, you know, I've had an eating disorder, they don't presume anorexia, they think I have an overeating problem. Um, so like these kinds of questions, right? Like this kind of, uh, whatever. Um, and then kind of moving on, creating access for fat people in the three dimensions that I mentioned. And finally, imagining fat, joy, love, thriving, and futurity. So imagining like, you know, the, and creating possibilities for fat people in the future. I remember like I really had internalized and I'm still working through it, right? I really had internalized the message that I'd been told that fat people, there aren't fat people in the future because fat people die. 
I really had this belief that I was like, there's no way I'm going to make it to 40. There's no way I'm going to make it to like 35. Right? I really had this belief. I'm 41, um, just so you know. Um, and I also, I'm, I'm thinking, right, I think back, I'm like, wow, like my grandparents all lived. I mean, really, like at the end of the day, um, in general, uh, across, like in the, in the spectrum of body size, with the exception of people in sort of like the extreme ends, most people will live to be the life, like the, the regular life, like 81 or whatever it is, 85. I don't even know what it is right now. Um, most people will. <laughs> and so I think like, you know, there's this kind of myth that I really internalized that like, I just was never going to um, see that. And I think it, it, that, that kind of myth is really perpetuated in media. Like one of the things I've noticed is when a fat person dies, there's, it's just like, they died. It's like, there's no, there's no, there's sort of like a presumptive, like they were fat, of course they died. Versus like, I mean, I'm like, versus, you know, if a 28 year old dies and they're a thin person, there's like a very long explanation as to how this like thing happened, right? And that kind of, that kind of subtle bigotry and like how fat people's lives are reported upon is like very impactful. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it was a really powerful exercise. I really would I remember, you know, when I first started doing fat activism, I was like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do a meditation, I'm going to imagine myself being 30 and being 40 and being 50 and being 60 and being 70. And I'm, you know, I'm like dancing and I'm wearing clothes I love and I'm being loved and I'm in community and I'm in this body. I'm not in a thin body that I'm imagining I'm going to have in the future. I'm in this body um, and I'm going to have wrinkles in this body and I'm going to like my partner is going to kiss my face before I go to bed, just like he does when I'm 70. Um, just like he does today, you know? And so I think like that was so powerful to do and to do that collectively is really incredible. Um, I I'm, this is kind of a, a, a sort of plea for anti-diet food positive principles because in our culture, the way we think about food is very connected to how we think about bodies and vice versa. So to begin with, all food is good food, adopting a positive and non-judgmental attitude towards all foods. Yes, even food that is labeled as quote unquote junk food. Um, at the end of the day, right, like this is not to say that there, there shouldn't be a critique of highly corporatized, like our highly corporatized sort of exploitative food system. This is saying that, um, you know, when we have really intense labels on food, it tends to lead to anxiety and disordered eating. It tends to lead to worse outcomes. Um, and I think it's important to have a harm reduction approach. So accepting that food restriction is correlated with worse health outcomes. Healthy eating can include all kinds of foods as well as periods of making up for history of not having eaten enough food. Lowering the stakes of food and eating. Every bite, in fact, does not count. Um, I would say like weight neutral, um, weight neutrality uh, uh, informed nutritionists would tell you every bite does not need to count. You don't need to like be obsessing over every single bite. Understanding that food is not just fuel, but is connected to emotion, memory, identity, comfort, and culture. Letting go of categorizing food into binaries like good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, I've already said that. Not presuming someone eats a certain way based on their body size. Trust our and others' appetites and food desires and have fun with and enjoy food and that, that, that matters. Okay, we're going to move into lightning round. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of fat activism very quickly. Um, uh, so one thing that most people don't know is that in 1967, there was a thing called a fat inn um, in Central Park where a bunch of people gathered and burned diet books um, and also uh, had signs that said things like, fat is all right, fat's cool. Um, I want to say also read diet books. Um, this actually kind of didn't get a lot of coverage, but Amazon has now put the same level of restriction on diet books as it does on books about like cults and um, like metaphysical belief systems because they're not substantiated by research. So I just kind of want to like put that out there. It's like, hmm. Um, so anyway, like, I, I mean, yeah. So uh, the, the diet book burning is kind of, I, I found very visually exciting to think about. Um, one of the people who read about the fat in, which got coverage in the New York Times. This is the this is the cutout from, this is a virtual cutout of the 1967 article in the New York Times. One of the people who read about it got really inspired. He started something called the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance in 1969 and wrote a book called Fat Power, um, which is basically like, you know, whatever you weigh is right. Kind of like one of the grandparents of one of my books called You Have the Right to Remain Fat. Um, 
Now, uh, so so NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, like I said, emerges in 1969. Very shortly thereafter, like you can open a chapter of NAFA anywhere in the country. So there's this one uh, chapter, and they're mostly women. A lot of them are queer, like Jewish feminists, right? And they're kind of like a little rowdier than the other chapters. And uh, and they get a letter from NAFA. They're like, NAFA's like, hey, you got to like chill out like we're just trying to get like we don't want to like threaten these people we don't want to threaten americans with like all this like other stuff and they're like well then we don't want to be part of NAFA. we're going to start this thing called the fat underground and we're going to adopt like basically black militant politics um and so uh they basically wrote their own manifesto called the fat liberation manifesto and again this is like where you start to see the fat movement become like much more explicitly fra first of all the fat movement fractures which a lot of movement does, movements do, right? So NAFA is kind of this like acceptance. We're going to do a lot of research. We're going to say fat people are healthy and we're going to be kind of non-threatening. And then the fat underground is like, no, we believe in militancy and separatism. <laughs> and um, and so, uh, so this is kind of where the offshoot of the more queer led, um, more sort of women femme led part of the fat movement begins which is really exciting because that's really we're, we're on the trajectory as a culture when you look at body positivity and fat aesthetics online right now it's 1000 percent queer it's 1000 percent derived from queer feminine fashion and aesthetics <laughs> and because it comes from queer high femmes um so anyway so so you've got this like fat underground and basically they're like listen this is not what's the point of fighting for my right as a fat person if i can't be a woman if i can't be a feminist so i'm getting oppressed for being gay like this this movement isn't enough for me and so you see the intersectionality kind of emerge very very quickly within the fat activism movement um the fat liberation uh manifesto emerges in 1973 and you can read that online i won't read you the whole thing um it's really exciting to read but it's, it's sad to read because basically none of these demands have been met even to this day um, and they're basically like doctors treat us with dignity, people treat us with dignity. Very quickly, kind of thereafter, we go into like the sort of the 90s, um, where you start to see the influence of Riot Girl, zine, zine culture. Um, this is kind of the fat activism du jour. It's highly influenced by not only queer aesthetics, but like sex positive. I mean, obviously, it's hard to, it's, it's difficult to separate queer aesthetics from sex positivity, but insofar as you can, it has a very kind of assertively sexual vibe, which is really exciting to see because one of the biggest things that fat phobia does is it says it renders fat people as like asexual or or gluttonous, or basically we're not agents of our own sexuality. And so I love kind of seeing Fat Girl Zine, which is all about like being a slut and like writing smut and being in a bathtub, being worshipped and being fed cake and like having a bunch of partners. So exciting. Um, so uh, yeah. So anyway, like, and you can see even here, this is like from the 90s, right? Fat and healthy. They're, they're talking about these conversations that we're still having right now. Uh, very prescient and also like very, I don't know, very real, very exciting to see. Um, and then kind of like, I'm going to, this is the last slide, but I have a little more to say. Thank you for, I know we're going over if you have to go, but um, this is kind of like the fat, the fat activist, fat positive community that I'm a part of. Um, and these are some of my friends and people I hang out with and work with and do life with and hang out in swimming pools with and eat ice cream with. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really kind of think about, you know, like what, what does fat activism teach us about how to deal with fat phobia? And I think like as, you know, as, as, as like folks in college potentially, um, I know not everyone here is, is a student here, but um, right, you're, you're being introduced to this political ideology. It's very, very upsetting to hear a lot of the stuff that I just shared. Um, and uh, and it, it brings up a sense of rage. It brings up a sense of anger and a sense of grief. And all of those things are really, really important. Um, and I kind of want to sort of say like, you know, things that, things that I've done briefly um, to kind of deal with that rage and that sense of kind of like, this is so wrong. What happened to me is so wrong. The very first thing that I did was try and find community of people who could affirm what I went through, who went through what I went through, and who would collectivize tools with me. Um, things like, how do you alter a garment to make it fit? I mean, this was before like the plus size revolution, really. But um, how do you, one of the things, first things I learned from another fat person was, how do you alter a garment that's not made for you? 
how do you like literally deconstruct it and then resew it up together um, so that it looks like something that, 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 that you like, that looks good on you? How do you learn to love and compliment other fat people? How do you learn to see other fat people as desirable when you spent your whole life being told that people who look like you are not desirable? Um, so like having that community of like-minded people, and it doesn't really, right, I, I don't think that it's like size dependent, but I think that if you're in a larger body, certainly for me, having other friends in larger bodies really, really mattered and was a really, really big part of like working through all of the feelings, whether it was joy or rage um, or grief or all of those things, right? Um, and I kind of want to say another really big way for me to work through it and for us to work through it has been through our activism, whether it's putting together like a fat clothing swap or it's going to like a conference where that's all about talking about how, you know, basically children who are nine and over a certain weight should have weight loss surgery and like going in there and just being fat <laughs> at them. Um, you know, like there's, and there's kind of, right? Like I think like there's all of these fantastic um, ways. And I think certainly the last thing I was gonna say in terms of a tool for me, it was like setting boundaries. Who gets to be around me? Um, who am I dating? Who am I looking at as potential people? A big one for me, like a big, uh, this became like a friend rule and a dating rule, right? Like I deserve to be protected from fat phobia. So A, I'm not dating people who talk about my body or other people's bodies or how I eat or how other people eat. Like if someone talks about, I, literally like if, if you are dating someone who talks about how other people look, I would not be dating them anymore, frankly. <laughs> Sorry, that's a strong statement, but um, but like uh, I think like striving to be in a relationship, whether it's romantic or otherwise, with folks who are not putting toxicity into the world is really important. Um, and I think also, right, like a big moment for me around my boundaries really came around recognizing, um, like I think for a long time when people would sort of spew fat phobia at me, whether it was overtly fat phobic or them talking about what, you know, they're disparaging to fat people or whatever, disparaging to gaining weight or whatever. I used to get really activated by that. Um, and, and there was a point at which like, I was like, oh, you are triggered and you don't know you're triggered and you don't know how to deal with it. And I have dealt with the trauma. I'm working through the trauma responsibly that you haven't dealt with. And I need to protect myself from you. In the same way that if someone were super triggered and had no idea they were triggered and they were activated and they were like doing, they were flailing and flailing. I'm, it's not my job to get you out of the water. It's my job, right, to be like, this is what's happening. This is what my responsibility is. And this, I need to sort of protect myself from this. Um, so I think that... Um, when, like when I, specifically, I remember I used to hear when people would talk about going on diets, it used to set me off. Like, maybe I need to go, even though I was deep in fat activism, I was like, oh, maybe I need to do that. Maybe after all this, and, and again, hitting a point where I was like, oh, diets are what you do when you're triggered from the trauma of being taught that fatness is horrible. Like you don't know what to do with that because our culture has just not given us any tools and your way of dealing with it is by not eating food. And my way of dealing with it is fighting the system. <laughs> and so I think like, you know, I mean, just kind of really situating, I'm like really situating, where is my power? Where is my sort of like locus of power? Who is set off? And like, who, who, who can I like, who is my friend? I'm invested enough that I want to help them. And who are the people in like farther out where I'm like, I can't even touch that. Like, I can't even touch that because like, you're not someone in my inner circle. Um, that was a lot of information. <laughs> Um, we went over. I'm just so grateful to have been here. I like. I know I shared like literally every single piece of data I've ever seen, and also every tool I've ever developed. So I appreciate you listening. Um, can we? Can I do a quick selfie? Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yay! I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do one like this. I'm gonna do like four, so hold whatever you're doing. Wait, it's on a timer. Hold on, hold on. Okay, okay, ready? <laughs> here we go, here we go. Okay, hold it, hold it. Oh my God, it's happening. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Yay.
Wow! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 